the record without having to speak. In accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, please contact a city staff member if you need any assistance. Public comment on a non-agenda item will take place during the citizen comment portion of the evening. These are items that don't appear on tonight's formal agenda. The city clerk will call your name when it's time for you to speak. At that time, please approach the podium and tell us your name for the record. You'll have a maximum of three minutes and there is a timer visible from the podium. When the light changes from green to yellow, your time is coming to an end. When the light turns red, your time is up. Note that you may also choose not to speak if other speakers before you have said what you wanted to say. Shouting, cheering, and loud noises will not be tolerated, and violators may be removed for disrupting the meeting. Goodyear City Council meetings stream live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and online at GoodyearAZ.gov. Follow the city's social media pages so you don't miss out on all that's happening in Goodyear. Thank you for coming to this meeting and being an active part of your city. And remember, it's a great time to be in Goodyear. For September 12, 2022, let's say we've got a new system in place. Please press that you're here. Everybody accounted for for the city clerk? Yes? Thank you. Um, would you please join Vice Mayor Hampton in the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for the people of Goodyear and this great city. Um, ask for wisdom, Lord, as we make decisions that impact the lives of everybody in the city of Goodyear and doing the work of the people, Lord. I thank you for, for the staff, uh, for public safety, and for military serving over and abroad. And as you also remember, uh, sacrifices made uh, during 9-11, and remembering that and the loss of life and the sacrifices that are made uh, by public safety and in the military um, soon after, Lord. I just uh, pray you be with uh, those, those, Lord, that uh, gave their lives and uh, the families, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, for, for loving us, and I just thank you uh, for today. In your name, amen. 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 Thank you, Vice Mayor, for that invocation there. Uh, we have one communication item tonight. We have uh, with us tonight Mr. Mark Eastless, uh, Superintendent of Aquafria Union High School District. Uh, Mr. Eastless, would you please come forward and introduce your co-presenters to begin our presentation? Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Goodyear community, thank you for allow allowing us to be here. My name is Mark Eastless, and I am the proud superintendent of the Agua Fria High School District. And I have uh, two of my colleagues here with me. And I'm going to introduce first uh, Ms. Megan Diego. She is our senior officer for strategic alliances. We also have Rachel Gross, who is my deputy um, uh, chief, of uh, chief of staff with me and we have a brief presentation to tell you all the great things that are going on in our high school district. Megan, we'll start off. Good evening. So Agua Fria Union High School District has five amazing high schools. We have one in Avondale, which is Agua Fria. We have two in Buckeye, Canyon View, and Verado. And we have two awesome schools here in Goodyear as well. You guys are home to uh, Millennium High School, which hosts our International Baccalaureate Program. It's a really worldly view of education and how people fit into the greater world. It's a phenomenal program. Also in Goodyear is Desert Edge High School, which is our performing arts school. It is quite amazing. 
In addition, it is an A-plus school of excellence. So we're really proud of all of our schools, but you can be especially proud of those two here in our community. Um, our student growth is quite phenomenal. Just like the city of Goodyear, we are growing by leaps and bounds. This year, we're at over 9,700 students. And to compare that to years past, that's about 1,100 students more than we had two years ago. To put that in perspective for you, each of the five high schools that I mentioned are built for approximately 1,500 students. So we are definitely over capacity at our schools this year. We're excited about the growth, but as you can imagine, it brings some growing pains similar to what you're facing as a community as well. To give some more insight into some of our accomplishments and where we're going over the next 10 years, this is Rachel Gross, our Chief of Staff. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everyone. I am excited to give you a brief update on where we are with our strategic plan that we launched this year. Uh, one of the most important parts to us was the community involvement in this. So in November, we had over 300 community members, uh, businesses, uh, we had parents, we did have, of course, faculty and staff, more than 70% of the people there were not our employees. They were actually people from the community that wanted to come in and share what they thought would, they would love to see Awa Fria, how they would want us to grow. And all those priorities were put together and we came up with the five tenets that they felt our strategic plan framework really needed to be based on. I'm just gonna share real briefly, because obviously there's lots of action steps and goals on here. Uh, one of the first ones being community outreach. We know that everything we do as a school district ripples out into the community, whether it's the workforce pipeline, the housing, the, the businesses that come in. So we really wanted to make sure that we are really embedded in the community. And there's a, some really cool programs going on even on a small scale, like our senior to senior program, which is taking some of our high school seniors and pairing them up with some senior citizens in our community and doing really cool projects together, whether it's decorating their homes for the holidays or helping work around the house or tours of our school. So really fun ideas like that, but just really getting to know um, everyone in the community. Career opportunities was also one of the biggest ones that people wanted, really making sure our kids were prepared for post-secondary, whatever path that is, whether that's military, whether that's starting their own business, going on to college, and wanting to make sure that they had all kinds of academy and choices for that. Academic success, of course, being one of our longest tenants with so many things as a school district, but everything from creative solutions to different scheduling, busing and transportation, to business partnerships that we can provide uh, internship opportunities for our students as well. Wellness and connectedness was another big one, besides the physical safety and security being so close to home and wanting to make sure that occurs, but also the mental well-being, the connectedness, our clubs and sports, and ways that kids really can come to school and be connected to others. And then resource stewardship, that being our human resources, our physical buildings and infrastructure, our fiscal responsibility. So as you can imagine, there's lots of things in our plan. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, which I'm super excited about, it's like, great, you have a plan, but how are we going to know it's going to get done? So we actually, uh, two weeks ago, launched a website that has all of the details of the plan, but there's also a digital tracker that you can go on and click on, see all of the ones that have been started, how they have been, um, all the ones that have been have completed, and the ones that we're still working on. So really want the community to know that they can see at any time where we're moving so they know how committed we are to making this happen. Besides the actual tenants, we said, of all these things, what are your top priorities? What are the things you want us to start working on right away? And Mr. Mark Eastless is going to come back and kind of tell you what we're going to start working on right away as the priorities. OK, a couple of things that we have been looking at, and we've actually worked with, with Julie, um, had some conversations with uh, city managers across the region, and uh, really talked about what is our role and our responsibility in workforce development. I think that we're all looking at, at, at as this region grows and what are we going to do in workforce development. So we're looking at an academy model um, and actually having some conversations with uh, Grand Canyon University, uh, Abrazo on a medical academy. We're also taking a look at, at some automated industrial uh, academies and, and trades academies, but places where we can put students in, on a pathway to learn. Uh, what Megan and Rachel are passing out is a packet that you'll have um, that gives you a, a, a summary of our strategic plan. There's actually two portions of it, and we also have um, what uh, Megan has created out of the Community Connect or the Strategic Alliances Department on how we want to be embedded into the community. 
Um, the last thing that I want to mention is that we are going out for a bond and override, and I just want to mention that no tax bond and override is to support these programs and workforce development. And then the second thing is just really to work on safety. Uh, one of the things that keeps me up at night is how are we going to keep our kids safe in school? And a big part of the bond and override, which is no tax inc uh, rate increase at all, not one penny, would be going into uh, safety and security and some of these workforce development programs. But this brief presentation, Mayor and, and Council, is, is just to let you know that we're on the move. We are working with your team. Uh, Julie and Laura have been great in, in uh, taking time to be around us and talk about uh, growing with the community and with the city of Goodyear. We're actually in preparation for a new high school that may land in, in your, uh, within your boundaries. And so we will probably bring you a little bit more information when we get the okay, uh, the final okay on that. With that, I just open it up to whatever you'd like, uh, questions or anything. I appreciate the presentation and thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes. Now it's time for citizens who would like to address the City Council on any non-agenda item with the jurisdiction of Goodyear City Council, are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Does anybody in the audience wish to speak on a non-agenda item? Seeing none. Going to the consent agenda, we are removing item three from the consent agenda so it can be heard separately. Okay. Will the city clerk please read consent agenda items two and four? through and four through seven by title only. Number two, approval of minutes. Number three is to be heard separately. Number four, approve the expenditure of funds up to $4,100,900 for historic Goodyear waterline replacement project 60046. Number five, authorize the city manager or designee to execute a joint use agreement between Trivium Preparatory Academy and the city of Goodyear for joint use of facilities. Number six, approve the expenditure of funds up to $950,000 for the purchase and installation of Motorola console radios for telecommunications. Number seven, approve the preliminary plat for Thrive at Goodyear single family development subject to stipulations. Uh, does anyone on council wish to remove an other uh, item other than the one that we pulled? I have one question if I may. For one different than the one that was pulled? Yes. Okay, go ahead. My question is on item number six, the expenditure for the Motorola radios. Will, will this expenditure bring all of our officers up to date with the latest Motorola's, or is this just a part, we're going to do it in piecemeal? It's on. Okay. Um, this is for the telecommunications center, so these aren't for the officer's portable radios or the vehicle radios. Okay. So this is expansion and improvement of the the communications. And this is all we need at this time for this? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see. Go ahead and get the motion for the ones that are up there, City Clerk, and then we'll bring the other one up, right? All right, can I have a uh, motion uh, for, what is it, two and four and four through seven? Let's say I do have the motions up. Uh, will the City Clerk open the voting? Everyone has voted. You have a unanimous vote here. Now, if you would, I guess bring up number three with presentation. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead and introduce yourself there, Jay. City staff. Uh, my name is Jay Karlovich. Um, Assistant City Attorney. And I'm here once again to talk about the exciting and hot topic of short-term rentals. Um, what is a short-term rental? A short-term rental is a property that's gonna be rented out for 29 days or less, or less than 30 days. Um, most of you have probably uh, enjoyed an Airbnb and a BRBO, and there's many in the city already. Um, from a historical standpoint, 2016, uh, the state law really didn't let the uh, cities do anything. 
in 2019, um, you could essentially collect contact information. Um, <clears throat> recently, the state legislature um, has come up with another bill and it allows the cities to regulate short-term rentals with either a license or a permitting process. Uh, back in February, we introduced the, the new regulations and on July 18th, we had a work session to get input from city council. <clears throat> Essentially, the new state law that came down here in 2022 and will be effective on the 24th of September allows these eight different items to be in your um, city short-term rental ordinance. Um, I can go through them, but um, there is permitting or license regulation, emergency contact information, um, notifying your neighbors in the neighborhood. Um, there's this uh, unique type of thing where you can only find the operators for verified violations, and we'll talk about that more in detail. Uh, the license and permit suspension can only be up to 12 months, and that's allowed by statute. Uh, sex offender background checks. Um, all of the uh, people that are renting out short-term rentals that go through VRBO or Airbnb, um, the sex offender background checks are done by those online marketplaces uh, to make sure that we're not renting short-term rentals to sex offenders. Um, also, the new state law says you can require a half a million dollars of liability insurance and uh, once again, VRBO or Airbnb or similar type of online uh, marketplaces provide those. Um, otherwise, most owners, I'm sure, are going to have liability insurance if they're going to be renting out their property. Um, lastly, number eight is um, we can require that the short-term rental license number issued by the city is on all advertisements, and that way we'll be able to see that everybody is licensed and we have their contact information. Um, we have decided, or what we're presenting, is to go with a, a license regulation process as opposed to a permitting process. Currently, um, the city issues a business license to short-term rentals. And we're going to replace that with just a short-term rental license and uh, a short-term rental license fee of $250 in lieu of the business license fee. They're not gonna get charged both. They're not gonna have to apply for both. Uh, the $250 is the amount, uh, maximum amount allowed by state statute. And the finance department has already done a study that um, that fee will be earned by the finance department to administer the program. Um, we also have in the ordinance um, a provision whereby in case of an emergency, we're gonna require the contact person, the emergency contact person to show up within one hour. And what is an emergency? It's defined in the ordinance that's in front of you, but <clears throat> essentially it's if there is an emergency and police staff is there and there's possibly a you know, large party going on and things are out of control, and you just have the people that are renting the short-term rental there, and we're just asking that someone get there hopefully within an hour to help the police um, mitigate the situation. Otherwise, if it's just a compla uh, complaint, um, the ordinance says, uh, please contact city staff or get back to them. It doesn't have to be in person by telephone, and we've even allowed, you know, if you just text us back or email us or just get in contact with us. We're trying to be reasonable with these regulations. In addition, um, the new ordinance that um, is in front of you requires the STR owners to provide the neighborhood if they're a new short-term rental owner that we're gonna do short-term rentals at this property. And what does that mean? If you're a single family home, it's gonna be everyone directly adjacent to you across the street or diagonal to you. What does that mean if you're in a multifamily building and you're gonna take your unit and turn it into a short-term rental? 
then you're just going to be required to just notify the same people on the same floor as your multifamily structure. Um, in the ordinance, um, the state essentially um, gave us some parameters in which we can find um, people who violate our ordinance. And it's only after a verified violation. And this is defined in the state law, but what is a verified violation? That means if you're violating a criminal um, law that you're actually convicted of the uh, criminal violation. If it's just a civil violation that you're found responsible for the civil fine that's gonna go along with it. And with that, um, the state statute says uh, 500, 1,000, and 3,500 for your first, second, and third offense. Um, in addition, the state law um, said that the cities or any of the cities, um, you can go ahead and suspend um, an STR license, but only up to 12 months, and only after three verified violations, three criminal convictions or a mixture of uh, a finding of civil responsibility, or if there is one verified violation that's really serious and there's a felony offense, a serious physical injury, or we have a sexual offender uh, renting out the, um, the STR or other things, or the STR owner knowingly or intentionally allows a non-residential use. And what does that mean? Um, you can't turn your residential property into a, a wedding venue um, in a single family zone. That's, that's, you can't just make it a banquet center. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is the state law and our uh, ordinance does not um, have any provisions for STR license revocation. It's not allowed by the state law. Um, if you're using VRBO or Airbnb, uh, they're doing the uh, sexual offender background check. If you're not using an online marketplace like um, one of those, uh, then you're going to have to do your own. Um, as I, I said earlier, the state law um, allows us to require a $500,000 liability insurance policy, and that it's reflected in the ordinance. Um, once again, if you're using an online marketplace, that insurance is provided by the VRBOs and the Airbnbs of the world. And lastly, we've already talked about how the all of the um, advertisements are supposed to display the city STR license number on all advertisements. So once again, I you know, we have the same list of the eight things that the state law allows us to do. And those are the eight things, eight primary things that are in the ordinance in front of you. Um, we're here tonight um, to recommend adoption of an STR ordinance with an effective date of January 1st of 2023. Uh, the new state law goes into effect on September 24th, and we wanted to be in front of you a little bit early so that in November and December, uh, city staff and I think uh, the finance department is um, working with uh, an outside uh, private vendor to have uh, an education program so that we can get everybody signed up and um, most of your short-term rental owners are going to comply and, um, and operate properly. And then um, our STR license regulations will become effective and enforceable uh, January 1 of 2023. Are there any questions? Hold that, hold that thought. Any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Seeing none, will the city clerk please read resolution number 2022-2266 by title only? Adopt resolution number 2022-2266, declaring a public record that certain document filed with the city clerk entitled Amendment to Chapter 8 of the City of Goodyear Code of Ordinances 
to establish a new Article 8-2 entitled Short-Term Rentals STRS and establishing an annual STR, le S STR license fee in lieu of a business license fee. Would the uh, council please enter a motion and a second to adopt the resolution 2022-2266. I have a motion and a second. Um, let's get, uh, let's see, open for discussion. Uh, Vice Mayor, you're up. Where does it go? For discussion. Do I have to do that now? Yes. I just had a question on, I think I already asked this question in the past. Did we, did we talk to anybody, any of the business owners who own short-term rentals before we, we made our recommendations? Any user groups or anything like that? I know we talked to the public. Sorry, I'm looking to Doug for that answer. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. We did not have any specific discussion with them, but we did send out a notification, a postcard over the last week to all known short-term rentals within the city, working with um, the company Rentalscape that we will be contracting with. Okay. I was just curious. I just want to get input from all, all parties when we make decisions that affect them. So, all right. That's all I had. I was just, thank you. Council Member Lortano. Thank you very much. I think this is, as we talked about in the work session, um, you clarified a few things, and I think this is a good um, ordinance that protects our neighborhoods, um, but it's not overly intrusive. It's going to allow the people that do this responsibly and rent out their properties to do so in the city and also allow um, us to keep control of those that do not do it responsibly and affect our neighborhoods. So I do appreciate this, and it looks like it will be up and running before the Super Bowl, right? That is correct. <laughs> That's the goal. Thank you. Council Member Stipp. You know, I want to uh, thank Jay and everybody on staff because I know that this was a multi-departmental effort to get this through. Um, this ordinance is the maximum that we're allowed to do by law. Um, it does not go far enough for the people who live near these uh, party houses that go through. Um, and I know that they remain frustrated, um, but it is uh, the maximum that we're able to do as a city. And, um, and I appreciate the effort that everybody has put forward to at least get us to that point. And hopefully the state legislature will hear from more folks like the ones I've heard from that have issues with this and maybe we can get future changes uh, as necessary. But I just wanted to thank you and everybody, the entire uh, team for getting this forward, thanks. Yeah, I'd like to echo those comments, and I'd also like to say for the, those that are watching, this is not the first time that we're seeing this. We had a thorough vetting at a work session, so just let the public know that this has already been previously discussed as well. So with that, let's see, I don't see any further discussion. Will the clerk open the voting? Looks like all votes are in. Yes. And it's unanimous. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Let's Mayor, see, we've got in here, um, we got the vote. Will the city clerk please read ordinance 2022-1555 by title only? Adopt ordinance number 2022-1555, amending chapter 8 of the City of Goodyear Code of Ordinances to establish a new Article 8-2 entitled Short-Term Rentals, STRS, providing for correction, severability penalties, and an effective date. Would council please enter a motion and a second to adopt the ordinance 2022-1555? I see a motion and a second. Open for council discussion. See no discussion. Will they open the voting? City Clerk? The votes have all been entered. All votes are in. And let's see, passed by a majority vote. Thank you. We have one public hearing on the agenda. Public hearing is considered approving a new Class A bingo license for Cantamia at Australia Community uh, Association. Let's open the public hearing. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Laura Hara. I am the Deputy City Clerk. 
Today, I am presenting a Class A bingo license submitted by Nicole Strick, representative of Cantamia at Estrella Community Association. Bingo is regulated by the Arizona Department of Revenue and requires a public hearing to take place for any new bingo license received within 45 days. The Arizona Department of Revenue does not require the public hearing to be noticed in the paper or to be noticed on the building. The city clerk's office received the application for the Class A bingo license on August 10, 2022. There are three types of bingo licenses. Class A licensees generally obtain a license for recreational and social purposes returning all gross receipts to the players in prizes. Class A licensees cannot exceed $75,000 per year in gross receipts and they are taxed at 2.5% of their adjusted gross receipts, the amount that is left, in, if any, after paying prizes. That is the amount left, if any, after paying prizes. Class B and Class C licensees are dedicated to raising funds for their sponsoring charitable organizations. They are taxed on their gross receipts, not their adjusted gross receipts. All taxes collected from bingo licensees are deposited into the state general fund. The, city's the city council's recommendation will be forwarded to the Arizona Department of Revenue. The state does not begin their process without the city's recommendation. The Cantamia at Estrella Community Association plans to offer music bingo on Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. at 1770 West Star Point in Goodyear and is hosted by the Bar Game Show Productions. The association will charge $5 per person with a maximum of 80 participants. The host will play five rounds with no cash payout. Winners will instead be given a $10 gift certificate to the Cantamia at Estrella, the, the Cantamia at Estrella Cafe as prizes, which are funded by the association's social events budget. The bingo license is valid for one year from the, from the date it is issued. Yet this application was reviewed by the police department and the development services department and there were no comments. Staff is recommending approval to the Arizona Department of Revenue for the Class A bingo license. Thank you very much. I'm available for questions as is the applicant, Ms. Strick. She's here for any questions as well. Applicant like to say anything at this time? You good? Okay. Uh, any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right, uh, would anybody in the audience like to speak? Noticing that, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing with the uh, council. Please enter a motion and a second to recommend for approval to the Arizona Department of Revenue a Class A bingo license for Cantamia at Australia Community Association. I've got a first and a second open for council discussion. Vice Mayor Hampton. I, I just have a process question. So I see it's only a one year permit. So do they have to come to this exact same format to renew their permit, or is it a, a different type of format after we've approved the first initial initial uh, application? I believe they have to. I believe they can just renew it through the Arizona Department of Revenue. Yeah, no, I appreciate. I appreciate you bringing it to us. I think the people at Cantamia will really enjoy the bingo. So I think. I think it'd be the only type of bingo we have right now in the city. We used to have a bingo hall, but I think that's gone now. So, so yeah, I think it's a nice amenity. So, thank you. Anybody else? All right, seeing no further discussion, open the voting. The votes have all been entered. Oh, thank you, clerk. And uh, past majority 7 0. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Now we'll move on to business. Uh, I would like to remind council to wait for a motion and a second before discussion. The uh, first item on business is to reconsider a disapproved resolution number 2022-2260 that was previously approved by council on July 18, 2022. Please introduce yourself. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Doug Sandstrom, I'm the finance director for the city of Goodyear. Um, the item before you tonight is in regards to resolution 2022-2260, which council adopted unanimously in July. That resolution adopted um, approximately 11 new fees related to building safety, and then was a consolidating all of our fees under one fee table for ease of administration. However, we did find out the exhibit to that resolution was attached in air, so it was a mistake. So tonight's action is to uh, vote for a reconsideration of that 
which would then allow council to vote on and disapprove that resolution so that we would reset our fees back to what they were prior to that action. Um, just September 1st is when the fees went into effect and they actually ended up impacting 70% of our fees when they were only supposed to impact 11. So this will reset us to the old stage and then on November 7th, we will come back following proper notification to readopt those 11 fees that were intended to be voted upon. Any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Let's see, um, two actions are required on this item. First would be the council consider entering a motion and a second to reconsider resolution number 2022-2260. Do I see a motion? I do, and I see a second. Please use your request to speak icon. Council member Bray. Uh, Doug, thank you for bringing this forward. I just wanna make sure I understand. So. We thought it was going to impact 11 fees. Correct. We implemented what you had brought to us, and it all of a sudden impacts 70% of our fees? 70% of our fees, correct. We had a go-live date of September 11th, so since we only had to change 11 fees, we went in shortly before September 1st to modify those fees, and then at that point saw that it was the wrong table that was attached. So we've been operating under that for the last 11 days. Under the wrong table. Under the wrong table, correct. Okay, so we're just updating the table to what we technically had approved. prior to the action, correct. So the reconsideration will allow you to vote on, basically, it's like an undo button for what we did in July to bring okay. us back to what it was prior. Thank you. Any other discussion? I just got one question on those 11 days. Did anybody pay fees at which are going to have to be refunded? None would be paid that would have to be refunded. We actually, any fee that would have went up by mistake would have been inappropriately notified, so we did not change any fees up. We only modified fees down if the fees had to go down. Okay, so there's, there's no negative impact no on negative the public. No negative impact, okay, correct. Thank you. Uh, would the clerk please open the voting? Everyone's voted. Thank you, um, past majority. Thanks for bringing that to us. Um, and then there's you. a second action. Oh, there's a second, excuse me. Uh, city clerk, everyone is voted. Please close the voting. Motion carries unanimously. Oh, will the city council please enter a motion and a second to disapprove resolution number 2022-2260. Do I see a motion? Second? Yes, I do. Can you all answer? All right, so a motion open for council discussion. We're good. Uh, please use your request to speak button. Nobody's there. Um, no further discussion. Go ahead and open the voting. Everyone's voted. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, presentation, Doug. Thank you. Motion carried unanimously. All right, the next item for business is considering approving the creation of a CIP project for the Goodyear Water Reclam uh, Reclamation yeah, I'll get that out, right? <laughs> Facility expansion. Please introduce yourself. Let me just set up this Elmo here for a second, if I can. All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Javier Serovic, Director of Public Works with the City of Goodyear. Um, I'm here in front of you to request the creation of a capital project for the first phase of the expansion of the Goodyear Water Reclamation Facility. Um, also, I'm here to request the associated uh, uh, transfers. Um, the overall budget for this first phase is that we're requesting $2 million. So, um, why now? Re uh, what this project is doing is it's really reducing the risk uh, creating a parallel project to a current solution uh, to remove the brine to the Water Reclamation Facility Council recently approved an agreement with APS, and I'll explain that a little later, what the brine is doing to the capacity of the facility. We believe that it is prudent for us to move with this parallel project in order to make sure that we can satisfy the needs um, of the city now and in the future. 
The water reclamation facility, uh, the Goodyear water reclamation facility is one of three, and I attempt here to try to show you in the map, um, if I move around a bit, this is not an overall map of the city. The southern boundary here is Pecos Road, where Rainbow Valley and Corgate are the other two small facilities that the city owns and operates. That, uh, those two mainly serve the Strait Mountain uh, development. The Goodyear Water Reclamation Facility service area is what you see in blue there, and it extends mainly south of Highway 10 and north of the Hiller River. And it also serves a small sliver, as you see that blue area, just north of Highway 10. That yellow line that runs across the uh, exhibit is, uh, is actually Highway 10. The treatment capacity is 6 million gallons a day, um, but the facility is built what we call a peak factor of two, mean, meaning that it can handle twice that capacity for instantaneous flow. So that, that adds quite a marginal safety for that facility. Um, what flows into the facility is uh, mainly wastewater, of course, from our businesses, our residences, and our uh, industries. But we also have brine that flows into the facility. And brine is a byproduct of treatment, of potable water treatment in our groundwater facilities or wells. During peak production of potable water from our wells, we can put up to 1.8 million gallons of brine into the Goodyear Water Reclamation Facility. That equates about 30% of its capacity. So it's quite a bit of a load on the plant. And as I said before, we have a solution that we're working with with APS to solve that issue. We also have what we call plan demands on that facility. And that is paper demands, meaning that there are potential flows that can come into that facility in the long term, uh, but it is, uh, I think, proper to recognize that those flows are mainly the result of residential developments that take a long time to realize themselves. And therefore, we keep an eye on those, on those flows and can respond accordingly. Um, in fact, um, the county has some requirements of when a facility reaches an actual flow of about 80%, they require uh, the design of an expansion to take place. When those actual flows reach a level of 90%, they require a utility to be in construction of those improvements. So with those high flows that we're seeing from brine during high production times, we are hovering in the summer at about 80%. And so we're just starting to get to that mark when design of an improvement is needed or of an expansion is needed. But we do have some current strategies. As I mentioned, uh, Mayor and Council approve a, a um, partnership with APS for a project that is moving forward on its first phase of design and is scheduled to be completed in July of 2024, which will remove that 1.8 million gallons of brine coming into the plant. At that time, if we look at projections of flows, um, we would be, with the reduction of the brine flow, we would be, we would be bringing the plant back to about 69% of its capacity, so well below of that threshold that the county requires us to, uh, to start design. But there are some risks associated with that project, and the risk is mainly revolves around the fact that we're working with another partner and we're going through design, and there could be a possibility of something that could delay the project or something going wrong. So we think it's prudent to start that parallel solution. The good thing with the design of uh, the first, first of design for the plant is that we are going to be um, developing what is called a design concept report, which is gonna look at uh, potential technologies, uh, ultimate capacity for the facility, uh, layout of, uh, of equipment in the plant, and also we'll be looking at some regional opportunities perhaps to create solutions that go beyond us or working with other partners. Um, so in turn, the idea is that both projects move together 
And as the Brian solution becomes more of a reality, we could potentially throttle down on the design and leave it ready for when we really need it. So none of those efforts or dollars will be, will be wasted. So with that, um, I'd like to ask council to approve the creation of the capital project, uh, plus the budget transfers uh, for a total of $2 million. Thank you. Any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Uh, can I get a motion and a second <laughs> to approve the creation of the CIP project 60109 Goodyear Water Reclamation Facility Expansion and Authorizing Related Budget Amendments? I see a motion and a second. Uh, open to speak. I've got uh, council member step up first. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Javier, when uh, we're just approving tonight the design piece of that. In fact, just the first phase of design, yes. Right. So, um, but the, I think the action going forward as we move through the years um, quickly, assuming that the APS partnership concept does not materialize, that would require construction to begin much sooner than we anticipate. Correct. So uh, for anybody listening to this or watching this or here live, um, what, uh, how much uh, are we talking about uh, overall project scope? Is this a $25 million project? Is it a $250 million project? It's, it's much more impactful. Um, we are, if we had to move forward with that project, we're considering it to be around $90 million now. And so the Brian solution becomes a much better option. Certainly, I mm -hmm. don't disagree with that at all, but I think it's important if, for us to understand that it's $2 million today, but we're looking at a $90 million overall design. And I think having that whole story is, is, uh, is important, not only for us, but for, for the residents that are, that are here um, listening to that. Um, do we have the capacity in the capital improvement program in these out years? This seems to be, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read through, and I've read this a number of times and I can't quite get my hand on it. Um, is it in the capital improvement project, the actual expansion, or is it just the design? It's, it, we, we did not have this in the, pro, in the capital improvement project. The main trigger for this, um, and I apologize for not mentioning it, another element of all of this is really its main catalyst is we're working with Liberty at this point to um, potentially help them with some capacity issues. So that's another element that has made us um, look at this, this uh, project as a prudent step. Certainly, so we want to expedite this. I, I, Correct. I'm on board 100%. Um, I think I'm just trying to make sure we, we try to get the rest of the story out there. So um, so we're going to go through this design period. Um, if, we, if this APS part doesn't materialize, now we need to move forward with actual construction, the $90 million. Um, I'm unclear of how, what the future of that looks like. Uh, we're running out of bonding capacity. Um, so I guess I would look to Doug and say, is this, I mean, I think we have to approve the design anyway. I don't think we have any choice, but this is the, the ball, this is rolling, getting the ball rolling. So once this thing rolls and we can't stop it. Correct, and th this is actually, it's included in uh, the fiscal year 2027, so the very last year of our CIP to begin the process. It's also included in our IIP, our infrastructure improvement plan, which our development impact fees are based off of. We are currently going through the process of updating those IIPs because this is 100% growth related. So the idea would be the results from this study are really going to feed into that IIP to help us set our development impact fees either this go round or the next go round. And then we would use development impact fees to pay for the construction. Plus we would most likely have to issue debt with development impact fees as the backup funding source for it. Okay, great. I appreciate the explanation. I realize it's not part of the project tonight, but I think it's important for us to understand once this ball starts rolling, this is where we're headed. So um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Bray. 
Javier, the, the solution with APS, which I think is a good one, I mean, we don't have any fear that it's not going to come online. I mean, I understand we're reliant on a partner that we have no control, but, I mean, isn't that supposed to happen relatively quickly? Yeah, Council Member Bray Mayor, yes. I mean, we feel confident that all of us have entered that relationship with the goal of completing the project, but there's always a risk. Uh, and then in today's world, with uh, development being how it is, we want to make sure that we're ready to support the needs of the city. So we're looking for an alternative. And then you hit on that liberty issue, which is a huge concern. Um, and, and I know they're taking actions, but it, it sounds like part of that liberty issue is there's more of a paperwork problem between us and the county or what the county is providing rather than what we can actually take in our system. Is, did I capture that right, or am I? Well, I'm not sure if I understood your question, but maybe let me kind of uh, share what the environment is. There is liberty, as I said, is um, without being specifically f uh, connected to the reasons why they're suffering of some capacity issues that are not allowing development to take place north of Highway 10. So they would reached out to us for some help, and we are working towards trying to figure out how to help them. So it becomes an element of our overall capacity. And as I had shared with mayor and council, since we're hovering already at the 80% mark, we wanna make sure that we do the right things and poise the city in a place where we can take care of our needs and potentially take care of a partner up north and support the city. That, that being said, I think you're spot on and, and thank you for doing all this, but I mean, I don't know that it looks future and it is preparing us for a lot of things, but I'm not sure that it necessarily solves a liberty problem quickly, I guess. Because if they're still not, if they're still issuing non-service letters and this project could be two years out, we're not building anything north of the freeway. Correct, it'll take some time for us to be in a place where we can actually support them. Uh, again, we're still working through the development, uh, oh, I'm sorry, through the development of a solution with them, and as we get more information from them, um, we'll be able to tailor a you know, solution if possible. We could take some of their flows from them now, but again, since we're around that 80%, we want to make sure we understand what the impact to us is and how the county looks at our operation. And when does, because uh, you say we hit the peak in the summer months, right, so what is our off-peak? Lows look like? Um, it could be as low as half a million gallons. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor? Yeah, thank you for bringing this up as well. So it's on the same line of questions that, that Council Member Bray had. So this just sets us up to potentially build a new water treatment, get the planning started for it. This does it not, this does not give us the, this isn't the, isn't allowing the interconnection yet for, for with Liberty and us. That's, Cor a, that's a different. Co correct. What this project does is really, as I said, it starts creating the baseline for the design of the expansion of yeah. the facility. But meanwhile, we're also working on the brine solution, which really is an expansion project. If you take almost yeah. 2 million gallons out of the flow, it's going to be um, a significant impact. But we don't, we don't have the, the agreement yet with Liberty to take their flows? No, no, not yet. Currently, not yet. Okay, because so I understand the timeline. It was, I think, Liberty. Their facility is about two years out. The APS solution is about two years out. So, I understand we're preparing in case we do take too much flows, and the ninety percent gets activated. And is the ninety percent once you hit that, you're locked in. You have to build a new facility, or if you go down the next year, can you not not build it? I, again, the guidelines are 80% design, 90% construction, just to allow a municipality or utility to react to typical flows. Um, it, they're triggers. Yeah. Um, and the county starts asking questions if you don't do anything at, when you reach that trigger. Okay. Okay. No, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for staying ahead of it and continue to bring more and more good solutions to us. So thank you. Councilmember Kano. Thank you, Javier, for bringing up the liberty issue because that is a key component to the, the discussion that we're having. Uh, we were going to do this regardless because of the brine issue, but uh, will the expansion that we're planning then be sufficient to meet the growth in our 
current service area. Certainly we're adding a lot of multifamily. I know that helps with water conservation, but I would think that it, it the, uh, conversely, it probably adds to the uh, increase of the wastewater treatment. And so will this meet our needs for growth for um, the foreseeable future, or can you tell us um, how far that would take us? Well, thank you. Yeah, that, uh, and that's a great question, and a great benefit of us starting the design concept report is this going to look exactly at that, what the build-out needs will be for that facility, and then plan a sequence of construction projects accordingly in line with as the flow increases, we will be adding capacity to that facility to an ultimate use. Wonderful. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer on anything I do. I not only have a plan A, I have a plan B, and sometimes I'll have a plan C. And, you know, I, I think it's really great what you're kind of doing on there. You just can't take the chance, you know, even if the brine pops in and brings it back down, which is great. It just means you have more capacity as you go forward. I think it's important that you just start the design. And I'm sure the finance director has got a plan in place. If we got to come up with another $90 million, I have confidence there. But just not doing nothing is unacceptable. So I appreciate you taking taking the bull, so to speak, by the horns and just doing it. So uh, again, uh, make sure you have a plan B in place. And I know some of the other issues that is brought up on this dais as well that we aren't going to have to address. So hopefully, you know, that some of that may be out of our control. Uh, but what's in our control, we need to start moving. So with that, I don't see, uh, let's see, no further discussion. Go ahead and open the voting. All the members have voted. Thank you. With that, majority, passed by majority vote. Thank you. Uh, does the council have any comments, commendations, or reports, or current events, or requests for future items? Council member Stipp. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I do. Uh, I, uh, I'm trying not to turn this into a street sweeper discussion. Oh, the stipper. <laughs> so... Um, but uh, about a year ago at our retreat, we talked about traffic lights. We talked about them quite extensively and we have been reassured time and time again that we are on it. Um, I was, um, I don't want to say aggressively approached, but I was aggressively approached uh, at a restaurant in Avondale, no less, by a couple of Goodyear residents who were very irate about the condition of our traffic signals and the flow throughout the city. And obviously they had heard that I had said something because they recognized me, which I don't know how, and, um, and really came, came after. It is the inconsistency of the application of the lights throughout the city that is getting people riled up. And I made a joke last week, I think it was last week when I came into the council meeting, that I hit every one of the five lights on the way here, and that was where I left it. But this weekend was kind of the final straw. It appears as though we are doing nothing. And I know in my heart that that is not the case. However, I find it, I'm seeing no indication that we're taking any action to get ahead of this traffic light issue. We are installing more and more of them, and they are completely unsynced. We have some lights that are turning red because it's time to turn red and then immediately turning green. We have other lights that are turning red for someone to make a right-hand turn when there's no other traffic. It is, it is out of control, and I, I don't know what I'm asking for. Um, I, I want a standard. If we can't... I can walk through my house and tell, uh, tell my device to turn lights on and turn lights off, and I can set up uh, an algorithm in any other network of things. I cannot believe in 2022 that we cannot do that with traffic lights. This is a CIP issue or this is something, but please, can we fix or at least stop screwing with the traffic lights. We had them really good at one point, and then they went off the rails. And all you have to do is drive down Pebble Creek Parkway from Indian School down to McDowell, or Indian School on Bullard down to McDowell, or down Litchfield from Litchfield, or from you know Indian School all the way down to Western, um, across McDowell, I mean, just anywhere. It is, Wally's laughing, I mean, it, it's frustrating. 
Yes. And that's where I'm going to leave it. So um, I don't know what we can do, but somebody has got to do something. So I'm going to go back to what seemed to work for the, tri for the street sweeper. For the love of God, can we please do something with the traffic lights? Just for Bill. Councilmember Campbell. My concern with the traffic lights is some of them are three minutes long, some of them are 30 seconds long, and sometimes you get the green arrow to turn from Indian School to Bullard and two cars get through, and there's 35 of us coming from church and we can't get through, and it takes four lights to get through there, and it just gets worse. And it's different on the weekend than it is during the week. Absolutely, and I come out the Earl Gate every day and I hit every light every day on either direction. It doesn't matter which way I go. It's crazy. And sometimes I can't get out of Pebble Creek for a couple of minutes, and there's no cars coming at all. And I thought that you drove up and you kind of make the camera wake up and see that somebody's there or something, but it, that doesn't seem to work. So I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what the answer is, Bill. It's been this way for 20 years that I've lived in good years. It's no different. Mayor, I'd propose um, if we have three council members who would like to do a work session, that perhaps oh, that would be the next conversation. Okay. What good is it going to do? I see two. I, see, I would suggest you just put it on the agenda. I would, I, okay. Go ahead. That's my recommendation. I, I, Are you supporting it? I, I would support. I was gonna, not, I, not a work session. I don't think we need a work session. We all know the problem. Just put it on agenda and I, the people I, in yeah. charge need to... I think a, a, an update on, on what we've got would be, would be good because, you know, it's like seems like this is like random, and I was just joking with the council member, Stiff, we could put a Lex on the traffic lights, but I, I think it would be kind of good to see what the portfolio is, what we have, where they are synced, where they're not synced, so we can tell people, because if I don't drive that specific road every day. Why you can't sync it? Well, well, yeah, what is synced and what isn't synced and if it's not working, just kind of like, a, I think that would be very good for information, too. <laughs> And I would propose the work session because there's quite a bit in progress um, to see where we are, where we're coming, what, and what's coming next, and certainly council direction on if there's another step. So I, I would propose a work session. Honestly, I don't know what the action item would be at this point without having the work session first. All right, with that on a lighter note, um, we're good. On a lighter note, we was able, I guess, the uh, Valley Under the Stars. I guess um, Councilmember Kano and Councilmember Councilmember Elect Vicki Gillis join me uh, after the third graders gave their performance on stage. We all handed out bouquet of roses to them, yeah, and the kids just lit up like a Christmas tree. They loved that. So they loved that. So yeah, um, it was I, you know I really enjoy that. It was a lot of fun, and uh, um, I know it was. A, I don't know what the number was. I don't know if anybody has any numbers of what it was out there at the uh, Stray event. I do, Mayor. Yeah, there was. I know there had to be several thousand out there because when I looked out in the audience, it was it was packed. But anyway, it was it was a great time. Enjoyed uh, the kids smile when they got their uh, roses, and it was fun. So, with that, does the city? Yep. Go ahead. You got something? I just had another thing talk about things people said in the community. I know we talked about it a little bit, the city manager, but I really want to look into looking at soccer fields in the retention area north of the freeway and what that looks like for sports tourism and helping the demand of soccer in the West Valley and what that could look like for possibilities in that area that we, that we own. So that is being um, studied as part of our um, Parks and Recreation Master Plan, which okay. is in process. You Thank you. Anything the manager have for, for us? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, police and uh, Fire hosted the annual 9-11 Memorial Flag Raising and Pancake Breakfast uh, yesterday at Fire yeah. Station 183. They served over 200 people for breakfast and all donations collected benefited Goodyear Firefighter Charities. The event was complemented with a kids area provided by Parks and Recreation along with a display of police and fire vehicles. Wanted to say a huge uh, thank you to our digital communications team for who also live streamed the event on Facebook. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, Ballet Under the Stars was also held last night in partnership with Ballet Arizona and the Estrella community. The event was held at the Estrella Lakeside Amphitheater with nearly 3,500 people in attendance. 
The Arts and Culture Commission kept the fun going beyond the performance with food trucks, free face painting, arts and crafts with Catitude Arts and other vendors. Uh, and a big kudos goes out to the many staff that helped make the event a success. Police, parks, streets, sanitation, and of course the events team. Um, last but not least, just a reminder that our library is current currently closed. They did finally receive uh, the permanent shelving and uh, it's, closed through con it's closed for construction through Thursday, September 15th. We'll reopen with regular hours on Friday, September 16th. Thank you. With that, uh, we'll see next meeting will be the work session on September 19th, 2022. With that, no further business. Meeting is closed. <laughs>